All right, AP Euro students, lecture number three, Soviet leadership in the 20th century, followed by Russian leadership at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st. So obviously we have Joseph Stalin. We're not going to talk about him. We've already talked about old Joseph Diaxiavili, so we don't need any more Stalin. Good. When he passes away, again, there's not a succession plan. It's kind of like when Lenin dies. There's not a real structure and organization. There's a couple years of battling back and forth. Eventually, who emerges from that pile of potential leaders is the former commissioner of agriculture, Nikita Khrushchev. Now, Khrushchev is still a dictator. He's still a communist. Do not confuse him with some mushy Western liberal. No, he wants to rule by force. and blah, blah. The difference between him and his predecessor is... He does not want to be as overtly violent and intimidating. So in 1956, he will give the so-called secret speech at the party congress where he creates what is eventually called the policy of de-Stalinization, where he will tell the Soviet leadership of the party that there is no need to be intimidating, there is no need to throw people in the gulag, there is no need for show trials and purges. All of those things are anathema against the policy of global communism. We are a worker's paradise. We create opportunity for people. There is no need for us to rule by intimidation. Now, does that mean he's going to allow free elections? or No. A free press? No. Limit tra uh, get rid of travel restrictions? Of course not. So, he's just a slightly nicer dictator, basically, is what we would put. Now, this speech is going to be leaked out. We hear of it in the West. We're like, ooh, who's this guy? Again, that is strategic. He wants the West to know, I'm somebody you can work with. I'm somebody that you can partner with. He comes to the United States. He wants to go to Disneyland. He has denied that opportunity. Nixon visits Moscow during the World's Fair, and they have the infamous kitchen debate. Link in this stream of that YouTube video. Watch it. It's pretty short and interesting, where they debate the policies of various countries, the, the economic ideas of capitalism versus communism. Basically, Nixon shows Khrushchev, the American pavilion, the exhibit that America has at the World's Fair, about the convenience of the modern kitchen and how you have these devices to make the, the lives of a mother's easier. And Khrushchev literally doesn't understand why you'd want to make somebody's life easier. That's not the point of government. That's, that's not his purpose. So they're just a completely different philosophical thought process. Uh, he meets President Kennedy in 1961 in Paris at a summit and is convinced that Kennedy is soft and unprepared for the perils that lie ahead. So he's determined to be more aggressive in spite of his anti-Stalinist logic. And so in early 1962, we start preparing to put nuclear missiles in Cuba, the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis, October 1962. We end up discovering this through spy planes and taking photographs of the area in Cuba. And then we almost get to World War III, thankfully Khrushchev decides not to go ahead with sending more missiles to Cuba and eventually agrees to take out Soviet missiles from the island. However, about a year and a half later in 64, he is thrown out of power by the hardline military guys who are upset that he did not follow through to fruition the plan to dominate the United States. Now, again, we're glad he did. because He didn't do that because if he did, we might not be here, but he is going to lose his job over. He doesn't die. He doesn't go to a gulag. He is kicked out of power, though. Oddly enough, today, his family will move to the United States, and his grandkids live in the United States right now. Kind of interesting. His successor is a guy named Leonid Brezhnev. The hardliners did not like that Khrushchev tried to shake things up. Brezhnev's time from 64, 64 to 82 is called the era of stagnation. If you are stagnant, you are not changing, you are stuck. And Brezhnev doesn't want to do anything to rock the boat. He does not want to make major changes in terms of a lot of policies. So let's just be nice, let's get along, and let's continue to move forward with our ideas. So he does one, one change he does do is called detente. Detente is a lessening of tensions with the United States. We sign a couple of relatively meaningless treaties and accords. We sign the SALT Treaty that limits the number of nuclear missiles we can have, but we put more warheads on each missile. We sign the Helsinki Accords where we say that we'll be nicer to people in Eastern Europe, but there's no enforcement to it. What are they going to do if we don't do it? Nothing. It just looks good on paper and shows that we're trying to be nice. Yay for us. Really doesn't make a lot of changes. He also institutes what's called the Brezhnev Doctrine. The Soviet Union will invade any Eastern European state that is trying to deny Soviet authority over it. We see that in Prague Spring in 1968. And then lastly, he is responsible for the invasion of Afghanistan. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture where we discuss the end of the Cold War. Moving on, Brezhnev is replaced by a man named Yuri Andropov. Andropov had been the head of the KGB. So he was a man who had been in charge of suppressing the Hungarian Revolution in 56. 
and the Prague Spring in 68. He had been, uh, so the KGB is the, is the CIA equivalent of the Soviet Union, so that is their spy organization. They're in charge of a lot of the assassinations and political maneuverings and whatnot that occur around the world. Um, we literally want to have someone who's not going to make changes. He's only in power 15 months. He's already undergoing kidney failure. When he takes the job, he will spend um, most of that 15 months on dialysis, where he can barely leave his hotel, his hotel room, his hospital room. They mock a fake Kremlin press room in his hospital. So they will put a suit jacket on him, stand him up behind a podium wearing his hospital gown below his waist, and guys literally holding him up so he can give a speech talking about the wonders of communism and the power of the Soviet Union. The guy looks awful, but they're trying to maintain the status quo. If you got a guy who's on death's door, you literally aren't going to make a whole lot of changes, and that's what the Soviet system wants at this point. The leaders of the party want to make sure we aren't doing any major changes. Um, Andropov knows he's dying. He suggests Gorbachev replaces him, but eh, still not ready for that yet because Gorby's a kid. He's in his early 50s. Whoa. So the guy that replaces Andropov is Konstantin Chernenko, who's in power from 84 to 85, only 13 months. He supports the ban of the Soviets not coming to the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles in retaliation for the Americans not coming to the Moscow Games in 80. Of course, other Eastern European nations join in this boycott because they aren't allowed to make that decision for themselves. And he doesn't really do a whole lot. When he passes away in 1985 in the middle of the night, President Reagan, no spring chicken himself at that point, is awakened by his staff telling him Chernenko has passed. And Reagan's quote supposedly was, how can I do any work with these people when they keep dying on me? So, if we finally get to the main course, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev is a man who is in his early 50s. Again, a product of the Soviet system but committed to trying to change things up. There is old Mikhail shaking hands with Reagan, and you see probably outside of his policies, one of his most famous affects, his large bright red birthmark on his forehead, which is a rather unfortunate placement for a man who is balding. It always looks like he shot ketchup on his forehead when he was trying to put some on his sandwich. So Gorbachev, you know, we think 50-something is not that young. To the Soviet leadership, that's like kid. And he is committed to trying new things. Why? Because he knows the truth. Even the West doesn't know the truth. The Soviet system is cratering from within. Decades and decades of no competition, of focusing only on certain aspects of the economy, have produced good results in some of those areas. But it's rotting from within. There's no motivation. There's no creativity. We want the laziest, wizened old head that's going to do nothing different. So Gorbachev tries to shake it up a little bit. It ends up being too little too late, but he's known for two major policies. Glasnost, which means openness, and perestroika restructuring. We'll talk about what those policies mean more in our end of the Cold War lecture, which is number four, coming up next. But for right now, Glasnost and perestroika are attempting to solve the problems of the Soviet system. They instead make them worse and exacerbate their decline. That was not his intent. It just makes things go faster. It would have collapsed anyway. It just makes it happen a little faster. Gorbachev resigns on Christmas Day, 1991. The next day, Russia secedes from the Soviet Union. That's the end of that one. Over the next two or three years, we end up creating 15 independent states out of what used to be the Soviet Union. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, the stands of Central Asia, Ukraine as well. So those are the states we get out of it. The president of Russia who will lead independent Russia into modernity is Boris Yeltsin. Now, Yeltsin had been around under Gorbachev. He had helped stop the August 1991 coup when Gorbachev goes on vacation and people try to overthrow the government. Yeltsin is an alcoholic, which will definitely contribute to some of his bumbling as a leader, also to his untimely death from cirrhosis of the liver. Yeltsin institutes what's called shock therapy. He's going to try to make Russia a dictatorship of some sort for 900 years a communist economic system for going on 70 years. He is going to try to overnight, within months, make that a capitalist democracy. It's a lot of change, really fast, that is poorly planned. It is a disaster. The economy of Russia in the 1990s is awful. The black market is much easier to buy goods than it is in stores. The Russian mafia takes a huge role in society. Many of these former state-owned enterprises now have to become private property, private ownership. Of course, who can afford that? 
The, there are a few Russians who had been in the party apparatus who become wealthier and had foreign investments. They're the few who have the money. So we have this term oligarch that you hear talk about today. These Russian oligarchs, not many of them, a couple dozen of them are gonna buy up most of the key industries that had used to be under the control of the state. And so they become multi-billionaires owning huge stakes in the Russian oil and gas industry. Russia supplies a lot of the oil and natural gas to at least Eastern Europe and much of natural gas for the entire continent. And this makes these people fabulously wealthy. Some of these people have ventured into Western life. Uh, Mikhail Prokhorov, who were on the, New, the uh, New Jersey Nets before they came in the Brooklyn Nets a couple years ago in the NBA, he was a Russian oligarch who profited from this time in the 1990s. It's called shock therapy, like when we used to just put shocks on people uh, to try to you know, do whatever. And so it does not go well. In fact, when he resigns on New Year's Eve 1999, his approval rating in the last poll taken before his resignation, 2%. 2% of Russians on New Year's Eve 1999 approve of their president's job. Two! He is replaced by Vladimir Putin. You can see the bottom of his uh, shirt up here. Let's make sure you get old Vlad. I don't want you to miss out on him. I know you're missing him right now. There he is. Vlad also was a KGB agent. So he was a spy for many years. He is known for a couple things. Number one, he is going to stop the democratic experiment. Yes, Russia still has elections. They are nowhere near free and fair. He censors the press. The state media is controlled by him, television, internet, etc. He frequently jails opponents before big elections. Good old classic dictatorship stuff. So they have elections, but they're not really elections that are free and fair. He also is going to institute more state control of the government. There is a thought that Putin might be the world's richest man because many of these oligarchs who had taken wealth in the 1990s, as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, many of them are going to end up jailed for life for various financial crimes and fraud. Many of them will get out, oddly enough, and move out of the country. So the assumption is that their companies are bought or given, in many cases, to Putin and the state. So kind of like Queen Elizabeth of Britain owns land, but technically it's the state's land. And her son will take it someday, and his son, etc. Kind of that is the thought about Putin and his control of the Russian economy. Now, this is incredibly hard to prove. The data is not out there because he's a dictator and he controls the media in his country. But that is the theory many people have. Because we're talking dozens of these dudes that have been jailed for various crimes early on in the Putin regime suddenly get let go, and they are never heard from again. Not that they're killed, they just don't make a splash. Uh, there's no public admission of guilt or anything. They just leave. So that is one of the theories. Um, he also spurs more oil exploration and natural gas and minerals in Siberia. So today, Russia is the world's second biggest oil producer. Literally, as we speak, they're in a contest with the Saudis about the, the extent of oil available in the world market, trying to drive down the price. Um, this is why right now, as I speak, on March the 15th, 16th, 2020, gas prices have fallen 50 to 60 cents at the pump in the United States in the last week is because of, so, of Russian attempts to control production with the Saudis. Um, this has also allowed Putin, this oil wealth has allowed Putin to be aggressive and dictatorial to other states in, in, in his interactions because he can, he can afford it. Uh, the concern is for him is if the price of oil continues to go down, that is going to make it much harder for him to flex on people. He has turned off the oil taps to Eastern European nations randomly for maintenance, but we're really designed to show like, hey, if you mess with us, Estonia, we can take away your oil. One time they took down a statue of Stalin a couple years ago, and within the next week there was unscheduled maintenance on oil production towards Estonia, trying to let them know like, you need to make sure that you don't make us angry. And so, because uh, Putin looks at Stalin as an idol, as someone to emulate, because Stalin was great. And so we're teaching that old good stuff in our schools to our kids as well. So, Putin is still the ruler. Uh, he is, you know, we, America has 17 uh, intelligence agencies. All of them agreed a couple years ago that he meddled in our election. He's currently supporting meddling in our 2020 fall election. Uh, and so this is without any sort of debate. Now, who's trying to benefit? That is debatable. And there's numerous sources for that. I'll let you come up with your own opinions there, or I'm not sure, that's fine. But the fact that Russia has been involved on the internet of trying to influence American opinions uh, into our democracy and interfere with our electoral process has been documented by all of our intelligence agencies. 
and he's trying to do it right now as we head to a major election this upcoming fall in our country. So Putin has become a major player in the world's uh, circuit. He is shadowy. He is um, conspiratorial. He is definitely, in, and he just kind of shrugs it off and goes, me? No, I would never do that. Uh, even though there's lots of evidence to the contrary that that is something he does on the regular. So those are the leaders of the Soviet Union and Russia in the 20th century and the 21st. All right, we'll see you next for the end of the Cold War.